Good morning, everyone. My name is Nathan Nelson. I'm the pastor of mission and outreach here at Bethany. It is a gift to get to share with you in this capacity today. And we are indeed concluding our series on gather, grow, and go. And so today we're going to be looking at this notion of go. And um, I hope you're asking the question, now what is meant by go? Because uh, I've already heard it from many people I've interacted with today, all the go puns in the world. Like, oh, uh, the choir is going to go on up to the stage now. Or we say, go Seahawks. So what is meant by go in our context, in scripture? And I'm glad you asked. This notion of go is simply this. It's an invitation to participate with Christ's mission in the world an invitation to participate in Christ's mission in the world. So that's what we're going to consider this morning, specifically from Psalm 119. But before we look at the text, would you join me in prayer? Father, what a gift it is to, in fact, be your children. Lord, to be part of the family of God. And yet, uh, Lord, we know that you haven't um, just invited us in, but that you invite us uh, as we find our hope as we find the truth of who we are in you and and, and in the community of those around us uh, to actually be a blessing, to be your hands and feet in the world in such a way that the world is made better, is transformed in every facet into your likeness, your will, your shalom. So as we consider this invitation to participate with you in what you're doing in the world, give us eyes to see and hearts to respond, we pray. In your name, amen. Well, I'd like to begin uh, by posing a question to all of us to consider. And it might seem like a strange question, especially amidst this era that you might characterize in the church today as deconstruction. Especially uh, those of us that are millennials like myself, we are entrenched in this uh, kind of phase of deconstruction. Why are we all really here? What does this faith thing really mean? It's also a time in which traditional denominations and church buildings within our city and various cities around the country are um, literally going vacant. They're calling this phenomenon church vacancy in the United States. Amidst that, of course, every, every week it seems like now we're seeing another pastor, another significant faith leader fall from grace in one capacity or another. Here in our own church, we're in a time of transition. We have a new senior pastor. You might not feel it here at the 930 because it's actually pretty full today. That's good. But if you were here in the before times, you would know that we'd even be cramped at the windows and things like that. Certainly at the eight or the 11 o'clock service, you would be wondering, man, where is everybody? There's less people in the pews. These are realities for us. And so at a time like this, here's the question I want to ask us to consider. Do you believe that the church can change the world? Amen. I heard a yes. Do you believe it? What are you doing about it? And as we examine this question in the context of our theme of go this morning, what I would like us to do is take an honest look at it. I'm going to offer some different perspectives and some context for you as you try to wrestle with that question yourself. Because ultimately, you have to decide, do you believe the church can change the world? And if so, how should we live? So that's what we're going to do. And I've got three eyes in your uh, bulletin there that'll sort of frame and outline our reflection for this morning. The first I is this, integration the integration of our worship, our discipleship, and our mission, our gathering, our growing, and our going. And second, incarnation, to embody the presence of Christ in word and deed. And thirdly, impact, the kingdom of God being made visible. So let's start with this first one, integration. To be clear, there's no order to these three of gather, grow, and go. Okay, it's not a linear relationship between them. It's not to say, all right, um, first you have to come to church, you know, attend, I don't know, every other Sunday for a couple months, and then maybe then you'll be ready to take a class, right? And then you, you're going to take your class and you're going to get a little deeper in your faith. And once you're Christian enough, then you can go, right? Go on a mission trip. 
or serve at the community meal. Something like that, right? That's not it. Um, I was laughing to myself this week as I was preparing because I got this image in my head, and I'm sorry for those of you that this analogy is totally lost on, but just bear with me. Um, uh, if, if you can imagine, like often in the church, we treat our congregations as if you are all Pokemon, right? And like the goal is to get you to your third evolution where you can go, right? Yes, yes. It's even called Pokemon Go, right? Ridiculous. This is not it. This is not it. This is far too simplistic of an understanding of God's truly holistic design for his creation. That these three are in fact integrated parts of a single whole of who it is that we are called to be in the world and how it is that we are to be in the world. So last week we learned from Pastor Richard um, studying the text in Psalm 1 that we're all invited to be like a tree, a tree that's rooted in Christ and that we sort of allow ourselves to be filled by streams of living water, streams of living water. And living water, of course, is just the revelation of Christ through all of creation and all different kind of facets of creation. And that we will, like a tree, when well-rooted, grow and bear fruit in our season. And we know, of course, that bearing fruit really has no relevance at all if it's not done in the context of community, right? And so for this reason, we're called to gather in Christian and quote unquote, non-Christian contexts alike. Pastor Eric taught us from Psalm 73 regarding this notion of gathering that when we encounter the pain and injustice of the world, it isn't until Psalm 73 verse 17, we go into the sanctuary of God, that then we can perceive God's place in all of it. So in our gathering, we're given eyes to see the reality that no matter where we go, no matter the degree of brokenness or bliss, that indeed what is said uh, in verse uh, 23 is true, that I, God, am continually with you and you, God, hold my right hand. And so it's with this background in mind that we're gonna approach the topic of go. And through Psalm uh, 119, We're going to do that. And what we're going to see is indeed this integration, the integration of our gathering, our growing, and our going, of our worship, our discipleship, and our mission. And so what we see uh, is that David, the psalmist, in this 119th Psalm, is shaped by and for participation in Christ's mission in the world. We too are shaped by our participation and for participation in Christ's mission in the world. And this plays out in the psalm through uh, its specific structure and the rhythm that is created by this structure. So let's take a look at this. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. I know that because I read it several times this week. Um, It is rather long. It contains uh, 22 stanzas, and each stanza Uh, represents one of the 22 uh, characters of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? So we have 22 stanzas, and within each stanza are eight verses, all right? So what's, what's really neat is that within this structure, within each of these eight verses and those 22 stanza stanzas, a rhythm is created, a rhythm of David professing his love for God's word on the one hand, and on the other, we see that the word actually impacts David's way of being in the world. It impacts his actions. So let's, let's take a look at this. First, let's see uh, David's love of God's word. So in verse eight, for example, it says, I treasure your word in my heart. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for your ordinances at all times. Verse 35, lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in them. Don't you love David's love? for the word. Sometimes I'm like, well, I don't feel quite that passionate, but good one, David. Good on you, buddy. But these are not merely praise songs of David about his love for the law, for God's word. Rather, what we see evidence in each stanza is that God's, or excuse me, David's love for God's word eventuate 
in his way of being in the world. His love for the word, his practices of his faith, they're integrally tied to his way of being in the world. So for example, in verse 46, we see uh, David writes, I will also speak of your decrees before kings. So here David is portrayed speaking of God amongst his peers and the rulers of the day. He's speaking about God. Verse 63, I am a companion of all who fear you. David is living out his faith in relationship with others. He's accompanying them through different seasons of their life. Verse 134, redeem me from human oppression that I may keep your precepts. Here, David prays for liberation, that in broken places being restored, God might become known. And so you see David's affection for God's word results in tangible actions that embody the living word in the world. And this is the integration of worship and discipleship and mission of gather, grow, and go that I believe we are all called to as followers of Christ. Now, uh, some of you will know that here at the church, we have what we call global mission partners. And it's uh, a true blessing under uh, my role in the church here as your pastor of mission to get to oversee these partnerships. And uh, it might come it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that we haven't been able to visit these partners throughout the pandemic. And so just this August, I was finally able to, with some other uh, friends here from the church, go and visit two of our three global mission partners. So I got to visit uh, World Relief in Rwanda and then um, Agros Internacional in Nicaragua. And I can tell you to, do, uh, to travel to Nicaragua, to travel to Rwanda all in the same month of August really took its toll on me <laughs> um, physically and uh, uh, mentally. But with that, um, it was an amazing time. And I'm, I'm excited to share with you uh, just a little bit of, of the experiences that I had there. Um, so first, what I want to do is share with you a slide that was presented to me six years ago when I first went to Rwanda. And then again this year. And I can tell you honestly that like many of you, over the course of the pandemic, I have been asking the question, like, what are we doing here? You know, What's, what is the point of, of all of this? Does it really matter? And I'm a pastor, right? And I can tell you that this simple presentation was part of a process that through the course of the month of August, my faith has been restored in the notion of God's invitation for the church more than ever more than ever. So let's look at this slide. Um, World Relief's uh, work around the world is unique in that what World Relief does is they actually um, leverage the local church for community transformation at a very practical level, okay? So for World Relief, um, the local church is kind of the secret sauce of its work, if you will. World Relief is, of course, one of the leading Christian development NGOs in the world. They uh, work in a lot of different places and are, are highly regarded for the way that they do their work. And there's a lot of ways that you might uh, work against things like climate change, work for clean water, work for um, kind of curbing the malnutrition of, of young children around the world. But the way that World Relief does it is through the local church. And so they have this slide, it's titled, Why the Church? And you'll see there's kind of three general statements there. And then uh, there's seven others that go into more specificity around why the church. And so what I wanna do is I wanna just read for you a sampling of these seven. And as I do that, I want you to reflect on your experience of church. I want you to think about kind of how you see the church, when you, what's been your interaction with the church. So let's take a look at this. Um, they say this, and, and, and my friend Moses Ndahiro, the country director for World Relief for Rwanda, does this way better, um, but I'll do my best to, to give justice here. So um, just, just a few of these seven things. One of them is that the church has the widest distribution. Have you considered this? That there are more churches in the world than anything else. Even more than McDonald's or Starbucks for that matter. There are actually more churches in Seattle than Starbucks. How crazy is that? Another one, the church has the fastest expansion. Believe it or not, even amidst this notion of church vacancy that we see playing out throughout the United States, some of what you may be familiar with happening in Europe, 
that the church today in the global South is growing faster than any other time in history. You have to actually go all the way back to the time that Jesus was walking around in his sandals to find a time that the church was actually growing faster. And, and I should say, just following when Jesus was walking around in his sandals and the stuff we read about in Acts was happening, right? The church was growing rapidly just following the death and resurrection of Christ. But today, it's actually growing faster in the global South. And then finally, um, I'll leave you with this one on this, the, the highest motivation. Now, I was, again, giggling to myself as I was preparing this sermon this week because I was reflecting on, like, um, why do you all come here? Like, uh, you, you didn't pay to be here. You don't have, like, a ticket that you bought from Ticketmaster in advance. You just kind of woke up and you came <laughs> Sunday morning, right? And, uh, like, some of you will even, like, give money before you leave. That's pretty remarkable. Where else do you go that's like that on a regular basis? I don't go anywhere pretty much other than maybe to visit friends or family where I'm not expecting something directly in return. I love my job, but if I didn't get paid to do it, I don't know if I'd still be here, right? (laughs) Megan's looking at me like, is that true? We need the money to survive, right? So this, this, it's crazy. The church gives us the highest motivation. You're here because you believe that God has called you to be here. And in your being here, that it matters. You can be of significance in the world. So these are just some of the unique characteristics of the church. And World Relief uses these kind of um, uh, ideas about kind of how the church is uniquely positioned to be of influence as they think about ways of transforming communities in a place like Rwanda. So what I hope as you've been listening to some of what I've said and maybe reflecting on your own experience with church, that uh, you might see that while some of these things uh, might feel foreign or or to actually apply them here would require kind of contextualizing a unique sort of way, that in the end, these things are not, you know, only applicable out there, but there's sort of a universal truth to this idea of why the church. In uh, 119th Psalm here, I think this is what David is getting at. The integration of spiritual and material life, of our gathering, our growing, and our going with the whole of society in such a way that indeed the church can and will fulfill its God-given potential to be the means by which God would redeem the world. So let me ask you again, Friends, do you believe that the church can change the world? I believe that it certainly could, and it has and is in small ways and big throughout history. Uh, We're often reminded that many of the hospitals throughout the world have their roots in the church. Critically important movements for social justice, like the civil rights movement, has its roots in the church where government resources and social welfare programs sort of reach their limit, the church has stepped into the gap. The church has cared for some of the most vulnerable people throughout history. Lepers, AIDS victims, cancer patients, refugees, fostering and adoptive families, families with special needs, the unhoused, The church is also a source of teaching and inspiration for those working in industries of all kinds, teaching us ways to consider stewardship, innovation, and ways of doing business that benefit all of creation. It's also not lost on me that the church is responsible for great evils in the world, such as the Crusades, perpetuating colonialism or slavery, ostracizing certain gender or sexual orientations. Hear me, the point is not to deny the great sins of the church. We have to pay attention to those things. Those things are real. Believe me, I see it all the time in my work and mission, all the time. But what I want to share with us this morning in the context of Go is to remind us of God's intention for the church. And I'll ask if you will believe with me again 
and its potential that we as God's people in word and in deed might actually participate with Christ in redeeming the most broken places of our world. So will you believe with me that in fact, you and I have a role to play in that? Amen? In Rwanda, where uh, we're partnered with World Relief, local churches are absolutely places of worship. I have been privileged over the last six years to travel back and forth many, many times. And in doing so, I have sung and I have danced and I have listened to preaching go on and on and on. It's absolutely a place of worship. But it's also a place where single moms or or challenged families can come and drop their kids off for care so that they can go to work. It's also a place where rural farmers can come and at the church learn sustainable agriculture practices. It's a place where people from the broader community, some of whom are Muslims or, or whatever it may be, they come and in these things they call savings groups, they pool their financial resources so that they can care for the needs of people in their community. So you see the church in Rwanda, yes, is a place of worship of the community gathering. It's a place of discipleship where people's faith is deepened as they encounter one another and they encounter kind of the multifaceted ways in which God would seek to restore them. And it's a place of mission where one might really be impacted in their experience in the world. So this brings us to our second point for this morning, incarnation, embodying the presence of Christ in word and deed. I'm gonna read for us verses 65 to 68 from Psalm 119. Listen as I read. You've dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was humbled, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. I love these words from David, because they first and foremost display humility. Verse 67, before I was humbled, I went astray, but now I keep your word. David acknowledges that it is God who is good and who does good. He says, I haven't always understood that. I myself have gone astray. So God, would you teach me good judgment and knowledge? Wouldn't it be great if more people said that today? I don't know about you, but I, maybe this is just me. I've experienced this thing where I'm scrolling on social media or I'm, I'm on the internet or something, and I see what someone has posted or shared or what some news media outlet has written, and it, I'm infuriated by it. Has that ever happened to you guys? That's, it's not just me? Okay. And I can tell you in those moments, right, it burns within you like how in the world Could someone actually think that? Like, are they posting this to be funny? But it's not funny sometimes. It's not funny to us, right? It feels so contrary to anything that we could possibly get our own minds around. And I'm going to flip the script a little bit on this and and just talk from my perspective. Uh, I'm sure for every person I'm thinking that about, they're probably thinking that about me, right? Right? Who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. That's what David would say. I don't know. We don't know, friends. We think we do. So we try to understand. We post things that we think are important. We read stuff from contrarian voices and whatever else. We're all just trying to understand, are we not? And so next time you see someone post something that just infuriates you, I want to invite you to do this very, very hard thing that I've been trying out. And let me tell you, it's not easy. Imagine that person just sitting on their sofa, like trying to figure stuff out. And they're reading, they're trying to figure out just like you, Archie, why is it smoky in Seattle? They're like, oh, you know why it's smoky? Too many people are smoking cigarettes. (laughs) Post. You know, they, they don't know. They're just trying to figure it out. We're trying to figure it out, friends. So how much better would it be if we, like David, could start with that? We're not the expert. We don't actually know what's best. But God, we do know that you are good. We know, God, that you are doing good. So our prayer might be this. 
Lord, help me be a part of that. Amen? Now, what I want us to take note of here is the link between God's word and good deeds. In verse 68, we see God's goodness and the good he does are connected to what he has said about himself and his statutes. This is why David says in verse 66, teach me your good judgment and knowledge for I believe in your commandments. David wants to do good. He wants to speak wisdom. He acknowledges that his capacity to do so is linked, get this, is linked to who God is and what God has said about himself. So friends, for all of us deconstructing right now, perhaps, for those of us wondering what the point of church is and all this stuff that we do, we need this. We need this link, this integration, if you will. Like David and like Christ, we are called to embody the goodness of God through our words and in our deeds, but not merely, uh, excuse me, our capacity to do that is not merely in the goodness uh, of ourselves and our own right, our own virtue or our own knowledge or our education or our work experience, the specific news source that we have found that's perfect. No, it's in the goodness of God himself. And when we, like David, humble ourselves and return to the source of our being, the word of God becomes who we are, whose we are, how we are, and what we do in the world. And then it doesn't matter if you work for a nonprofit or a multinational corporation, if you work at a church or a coffee shop or a tech company, if you're a student or a stay-at-home parent, Maybe you're an athlete or a musician, an artist. If you're married, if you're single, if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're white, if you're Latino, young, old, whatever the case may be, you, friend, will be the presence of Christ in the world. As we're connected to the source, we become a part of what Christ is doing in the world. And that is what it means to go. Now, I'm not saying, okay, I got it. I want to go. When's your next mission trip? When does the community meal take volunteers? Something like that. Hear me, those are important things. Those are means by which, believe me, I spend my whole week working on stuff like that. Those are means by which broken places can be restored. But they're not the only means. Mission is first and foremost about becoming the people that we were made to be. The word of God coming alive in the words that we say and in the things that we do and whose we are and how we are and what we do as the people of God in the world. Go ahead and put the photo up there. This is a gentleman that I met in Nicaragua this year. He's an agro staff employee and his name is Rigoberto. He goes by Rigo for short and Rigo is a stud. On, mo- on many levels. I've gotten to know this guy over the years, and he started out working at Agros as kind of just a basic entry-level position. His job was to equip farmers with some new practices that should increase their yields. But Rigo, um, at his heart and, 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 and kind of the core of who he is, he's an inventor. He's an innovator. And what Rigo has done is he went out in the fields in his free time and in the kind of different, the hills of the community where they work, and he discovered nutrients in the soil, natural resources that when fermented and these kinds of things in just the right way can create a biofertilizer that has unlocked the potential of this land in a whole new way. I've seen coffee plants all over the world, and I've never seen coffee plants like the ones in these agros communities. They are bursting with berries. You cannot fit another bean on the branch of this. I know some Starbucks employees are like leaning in right now. What are you trying? What are you saying? It's amazing. But what's beautiful to me too is that Rigo is not a pastor. He's an agronomist. And it is, he's more than that. He's an innovator. Someone whom God has given great wisdom to and an eagerness to learn, a curiosity about things like the soil. And leveraging all of that, he has unlocked the potential of a community in such a way that people are repaying loans they've taken on land, buying their own homes for the very first time, rather than chasing the next harvest. 
children are being nourished and growing in ways with education and healthcare and the kinds of things that they never otherwise would have had the chance to do. And this is a complex process. Rigo is one of many different parts of it, but he's an essential part of it. He's an agronomist. What are you? Who is God making you to be to unlock his kingdom vision in the world? And this brings us to our final point for this morning, impact, kingdom of God made visible. You might rightly be asking the question, okay, what's the end of all this? Yes, I believe the church can change the world, but scripture also says that the poor will always be with us. So what's, what's kind of the point? Now, Richard has taught for many years here this really important notion of an invitation to make the kingdom of God visible in the world. The key word there is visible. We're called to make the kingdom visible by way of snapshots of the kingdom, glimpses, if you will, of shalom and all that God invites us to. No one of us, no single church, no single organization or company or brilliant mind can change all the problems of the world. It's not what we're invited to do, but we are invited to do what's within reach for each one of us for each community like Bethany Community Church. What is within reach for us? How can we create glimpses, snapshots, if you will, of the kingdom? Agros Nicaragua is a snapshot of the kingdom. The church in Rwanda is a snapshot of the kingdom. Bethany's partnership with World Relief here in Seattle, resettling refugees and vulnerable immigrants, wrapping around folks when they're newly arrived, Ukrainians, Afghans, giving them a place to call home on the far side of suffering, led by Melissa sitting right there. That's a snapshot of the kingdom. School partnerships, where we have folks from amongst the congregation mentoring children who have challenged relationships at home or or with their schoolwork. Snapshot of the kingdom. There's a guy, Andrew Howe, who... uh, runs a climbing gym called Uplift Climbing uh, from within the congregation here. And he, on a daily basis, gives people a place of community and to experience the way their body was created uh, to glorify God. And just recently, he sold excess uh, gear that they had and he gave the proceeds to our partnership at Aurora Commons. That's a snapshot of the kingdom. We hear enough, do we not, about broken, seemingly hopeless stories in our news cycle critical commentaries on faith institutions, yet another pastor falling from grace. We just walk outside in Seattle, even this last week, we sniff the air and we're reminded of our rapidly deteriorating climate. These are all true things. It's important for us to pay attention to them. But don't miss this, friends. These snapshots of the kingdom are also true. Amen? These aren't just feel-good stories. I share them with you. I remind us of them for us to consider as we ask this question yet again. Let me ask you again. Do you believe the church can change the world? I'm going to finish with this story um, from my time in Rwanda. When I was there, uh, we were invited to go back to the World Relief office in the district of Musanze where we partner. And there's about eight staff who've long worked in this region. I've gotten to know pretty well over the years. And um, they had a party for us. There was decorations on the wall and a beautiful meal was prepared. And um, so we're enjoying fellowship with one another, hearing about each other's lives, what's going well, how we can be praying for each other. And they sort of pause and they say, okay, we're gonna transition now. And they said, we have a, a special ceremony prepared. And um, they asked me to kind of come and sit in the middle of this circle. And so I'm kind of awkwardly sitting there. And they said, Nathan, we are going to give you a Rwandan name. And it's like, oh my gosh, okay, what does this mean? They, They went on to explain that I was going to have my Rwandan birth. And the way that they um, name their children, a newborn baby in Rwanda, is they bring the community together and each person from the community will offer a name and the meaning for that name. And then the elder from the community will decide which is most fitting and that will be the child's name. So they said, Nathan, we're gonna do this for you. And um, they had someone come who, uh, his name was Buende, 
You'll see a picture of him and I up there on the screen. I call Buende Papa Buende in part because over the years that I've known him, I've seen him father many, many children, some of whom are his biological children and some of whom are not. Um, but he's like a father throughout this whole region of Musanze. And when my own father passed, uh, he was a real blessing to me and let me know in the limited English he has that he's praying for me, that he's there with me and gave me a huge hug uh, the first time I saw him after this happened. So I call him Papa Buende. And so Papa Buende was invited as the elder to come and decide what my name would be. So everyone on the staff, they go ahead uh, uh, sharing these different names. And, and then the one that Buende decided on was um, Bigui. And Bigui means achiever. So I thought, okay, what does this mean? And they went on to explain this. And this is why I share this story with you today. They said, we, we chose achiever for you, Nathan, because you are the face of Bethany Community Church to us. And we want to acknowledge all that God has done in Rwanda on behalf of Bethany Community Church. Literally thousands of lives transformed because whether you know it or not, a portion of what you give to the church goes to our partnership in Rwanda. And those people's lives, they believe it and they live it with their whole self are better because of those gifts, because of the work of World Relief in Rwanda. The church is a place of meeting spiritual and material needs because of the work that we are partnered in doing. Did you know that you're part of that story? I share this with you to say, friends, we are all invited to be reminded of the, the big weeness of the calling on the church for God to achieve much on our behalf. And he's doing it and he will do more of it. So, as we prepare to close in just a moment, I'll invite the worship band back out now. I want you to consider for yourselves, what are moments where you've experienced a snapshot of the kingdom? If you look in your bulletin there at the bottom of your outline for this morning, there should be some space. Those of you that already took too many notes, good on you. But for the rest of you that have probably a lot of space, would you reflect what is a snapshot that you've seen of the kingdom? Just write it down there in a few words. And I would invite you to rip it off and come and bring it forward up here and, and, and bear testimony together of, of all the ways that God is working. But if you did that, you would lose your QR code, which is on the back of your bulletin that you need for uh, your, your, your fall connect guide. So we're not gonna do that. What we are gonna do is we're gonna write that down. And after you finish writing, would you stand and sing and when you listen to the voices of those around you, be reminded that those voices bear testimony to these snapshots of the kingdom. Friends, we're better together. Do you believe it? Let's pray. Jesus, we just acknowledge that we're yours. We ask like clay within your hands that you would shape us evermore to be not just individuals, but a people, Lord by which you would transform the world. It feels crazy to say, but may it be so. In your name, amen.